Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is April Wepler. I am the Engagement Coordinator at the Canadian Environmental Law Association, or CELA. Our webinar today is the second in our four-part series titled, Where's the Protection? And we're discussing the review and reform of the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, or SEPA. SEPA regulates a broad range of things in Canada from the most dangerous pollutants to plastic manufactured items to genetically engineered animals. Today's webinar will focus on the fix with SEPA and we'll share the highlights of the parliamentary process on Bill S5 as well as the solutions needed to address and strengthen Bill S5 as it makes its way through the House of Commons. If you missed it, the first webinar in the series is available on CELA's website um, on the same event page that you used to register for today's session and we'll share that link in the chat box in a little bit. So I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement I'm calling in today from Guelph. I live on the banks of the Speed River, on the traditional lands of Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee peoples, and on the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the Six Nations of the Grand Watershed. And I'll start off by telling you a little bit about CELA. So the Canadian Environmental Law Association is a specialty legal clinic within the Ontario-wide network of clinics funded by Legal Aid Ontario. We work to protect human health and the environment by seeking justice for those harmed by pollution and by working to change policies to prevent such problems in the first place. As a legal aid clinic, our top priority is to represent low income individuals and communities and to speak up for those with less influence and less of a say in decision making. And we're pleased today to be co-hosting our webinar with Nature Canada, one of the oldest national nature conservation charities in Canada. For 80 years, Nature Canada has helped protect over 110 million acres of parks and wildlife areas in Canada and countless species. Today, Nature Canada represents a network of over 100,000 members and supporters and more than 800 nature organizations. Nature Canada is engaging in the modernization of SEPA in order to protect the genetic integrity of wild species and ecosystems and to ensure that Indigenous peoples' rights are respected. A quick bit of housekeeping, a reminder to please keep your microphones muted during the session so we don't have issues with background noise. We are recording the session today and we'll share the link as well as any slide decks and other resources with everyone who's registered via email and it will also be posted on our website. Should you have any questions during the session, please feel free to put those in the chat box at any time and we'll address them during the Q&A at the end of the session. And a reminder that we do have, um, our webinar is running until 2.15 p.m. today. So even if the presentations run close to two o'clock, please stay with us so we'll have some time for Q&A. You're also welcome to introduce yourself in the chat box now. Um, you are welcome to share a land acknowledgement if you would like to. Um, it would be lovely to get a sense of who is on the line with us today. Uh, and speaking of who's on the line, I'll just introduce very quickly who we have um, from our two organizations. So from CELA, including myself, we also have Faye DeLeon, who's our senior researcher and paralegal, Joseph Castrilli, who's counsel, and our current articling student, Zoe St. Pierre. From Nature Canada, we have Mark Butler, senior advisor and lead on this work for Nature Canada, and Hugh Benavides, advisor to Nature Canada on SEPA reform. And you'll likely hear from many of them during the discussion portion at the end of the webinar. And for our speakers today, we are pleased to welcome Senator Rosa Galvez, member of Senate Committee on Energy, Environment and Natural Resources, as well as Joseph Castrilli, lawyer at CELA, and Hugh Benavides, advisor at Nature Canada. And I'll be introducing each of those speakers before they present. So before I introduce our first speaker, I want to do a couple of very quick polls, which you will have seen before if you joined us for our first webinar. And our first poll just gives us a sense of who we have on the line with us today. So if you can take a moment and let us know what sector you work in or you represent today, we would appreciate that. So I'm gonna leave this up for five or 10 more seconds so everyone can respond. And then I will take this down and show it back to you. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, our next question, I want to move through these a little bit more quickly than I sometimes do if you've seen these before, just to make sure we have lots of times for our presentation. Our next question is about where you're located in the country and a geography test at the same time. So if you know your ocean basin, if you can let us know what it is, and if not, we do have a space for other, if we didn't cover you or unsure. And if you do click on other, I'd love if you let us know in the comments. 
where you're calling in from today. Just leave that up for a couple more seconds and share that back so that everyone can see where folks are from today. And our last question today, always really helpful to have an understanding of how knowledgeable you feel you are about this very complicated topic. I know there's a lot to this, but if you can give us a sense, that's helpful. So I'll just leave this up for about five more seconds. Okay, I'll just show that back. Hopefully those three people who said they're very knowledgeable include our speakers. All right, so at this point, um, Zoe, you can take that introductory slide down. Um, Senator Galvez, you are welcome to go ahead and start sharing your slides while I introduce you. So everyone, it is my pleasure to introduce Senator Rosa Galvez. The Honorable Rosa Galvez is an environmental engineer, an independent senator at the Senate of Canada, and the president of the Parliamentary Network on Climate Change of Parliamericas. She obtained a degree in sanitary engineering in her native country of Peru and a master and doctorate degrees at McGill University in Montreal. She was a professor at Laval University in Quebec for over 25 years and was chair of its civil and water engineering department from 2011 to 2016. She specializes in pollution control, water and wastewater treatment, watershed management, sustainable development, municipal and hazardous waste, site remediation, impact assessment, and climate risk to infrastructure. At the Senate of Canada, she is a member of the Standing Senate Committee on National Finance and the Senate Standing Committee on Energy, the Environment and Resources, which she chaired during the 42nd Parliament. In 2021, she was the sponsor in the Senate of the Canadian Net Zero Emissions Accountability Act, providing an accountability framework for the Canadian federal government to achieve its net zero emissions goal by 2050. She was also recipient of the Clean 50 Award 2021 for her parliamentary work on climate and the environment. Since her appointment to the Senate, Senator Galvez has published several policy papers, including a discussion paper on Canada's building codes and a white paper on a clean and just recovery from the COVID-19. Sorry, I have lost the second part of, here we go. Sorry, <laughs> just for from the COVID-19 pandemic. In March of 2022, she published a white paper on aligning Canadian finance with climate commitments, which led to the introduction in the Senate of Bill S243, the Climate Aligned Finance Act, legislation to help guide Canada's financial sector in its transition to a net zero economy. And with that, I will pass the microphone over to Senator Galvez. Go ahead. Thank you, April. Thank you so much for everybody here today with us um, to discuss and debate and, and have this dialogue about this very important bill, the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. Now, hopefully, um, you let me know if my screen, uh, my, uh, okay, so I, my PowerPoint is not moving. Uh, no. I'm sharing it, but it can, it doesn't want to go. Doesn't want to advance for you. To oh, advance no. for me. So where is that uh, bottom? Um, ah. Okay, maybe if I go this way, and uh, you let me know if you see it. No, you cannot see it, eh? We can see your intro slide, but it's not. Yeah, advanced. it does. It's not moving. It doesn't, want not, to okay. it doesn't want to move. Mm -hmm. So, okay, let me, I have you to want to have back. Zoe put it up. I know that. Uh, no, I can try, I try something else very quickly. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's, okay, let's do this. Let's do this. And let's do this. Mm. No, you don't see it. We can see it, but not full screen. You can see it, but not full screen. Will it, this will work like that? It will work like that. We can see your speaking notes. I don't know like if you this. Fine. Yeah. There, that's better. Yeah, okay. that was, okay. fine. Thank sure. you. Okay, so um, you, as you may know, this um, act initially was adopted in 1999. It has been 20 three years it haven't been touched by the government and yet it's such an important uh, uh, act because it manages toxic substances. It's so important to the environment. And, um, and finally, 
finally, after 20 year, 23 years, we are now uh, modernizing it. Um, it's very interesting to uh, remark that in 2017, the House of Commons wrote a report uh, where 87 recommendations were there. And uh, unfortunately, only a few of them are addressed in this version of the bill. Um, it still misses uh, many points. Um, confidentiality, risk assessment, climate change, pesticide, engineer, uh, organism, uh, um, engineering um, or, organisms, radioactive substances, electromagnetic radiations, and many and several issues with uh, for indigenous that are important to indigenous people. So, you know, we always have to say, okay, this is better than nothing. And so we will accept this, but I think uh, we, we did a big push in the Senate and I want you to force and to keep pushing so, our colleagues in the House of Commons do the uh, job that is remaining to be done. So um, despite of the fact that this is a very big, um, huge act with 356 clauses, there is only 69 that were modified in this, in this version. So we have, um, we have the right of healthy environment. We have the list of substances capable of, of becoming toxic, which is the watch leaks. A list. Uh, it splits toxic substances into two tiers. Uh, it offers a stronger regime for substances that are under SIPA and of highest risk. Um, however, the definition of highest risk is not there, so that's that's there to uh, to um, to amend still. And there is the references to vulnerable populations and cumulative effects, but it doesn't do. Um, much for indigenous populations. So we, we still have a lot of work to do. Um, maybe, uh, and also another important thing to say is that in the past, there have been several uh, suits regarding this, this act and um, um, the final decisions and uh, who at the end has the power to decide when it's toxic for who is toxic and how it should be managed uh, is subject of, um, of uh, debate and uh, in court. And um, the, global, the global consensus is that when you have to go to, to court in order to solve uh, an issue with respect a bill an act is because that's not clear in the act. And so we are seeing today an incredible increase in litigations with respect to environmental matter because uh, bills are not necessarily uh, very clear. Um, so uh, the, this bill arrived into the Senate and uh, it was a study from April to June in 2022. Um, this is uncommon. Usually government bills uh, starts in the other chamber and comes an end in the Senate. Uh, but the government has now adopted this uh, um, new approach to start some of their bills in the Senate. Um, and in this case, so we studied it five months. We had five meetings with witnesses. Uh, we received 62 briefings, which I appreciate because many of them came from um, non-government organizations and, and raised many issues that were not uh, seen by the committee. This is very important. So. With respect to the people that came and talked to us in the uh, uh, in during Senate committee sittings, we have uh, you know uh, thirty percent industry, um, a little bit more of thirty percent with NGOs. We have a lot of academics too, eleven percent. Then of course the government was there, and we have a presence of ten percent of indigenous people representatives that came and. Uh, told us about, about their issues. Um, I was very happy to see that there were um, 50 something plus amendments that were brought into the committee. Um, some arising directly from uh, these 87 recommendations made in the uh, by the House of Commons, some others that were um, um, uh, were raised by non-government organizations and, and of course, um, some other amendments that individual senators thought about by their own. So um, 
36 amendments were carried. I'm happy to say that um, I think 15 came from our office. And um, among of these amendments, three touch uh, right on indigenous peoples, because as I said, there was no enough on this area. Um, reference to indigenous knowledge and free prior and informed concern. Uh, we wanted also five-year reports on indigenous consultations in relation to the act. Um, and um, other amendments were on the reducing animal testing, seven amendments passed in, the, in this area. So S5 now introduces the principles of replacing, reducing, and refining the use of vertebrate animals in this while testing substances. Um, and uh, other, uh, other sets of amendments, but, but um, not as enough as we thought, uh, were three plus amendments to try to strand the right to a healthy environment and other environmental protections. As um, I, uh, maybe you didn't hear my speech um, when I touched this subject of the right to healthy environment, the um, very discouraging and um, issue was that it was a, a right that was limited by factors, including economic factors. And uh, it was not a constitutional right. Um, it gave uh, some power to uh, the minister to come later and develop these uh, the mechanisms by which uh, this uh, this uh, um, right is going to be implemented and then there was a lot to you know, we had to do and correct and redress some issues with respect to transparency and accountability 11 amendments were in that area um, in order for example to um, have more and meaningful public uh, participations, uh, also focus on pollution prevention. And this is very, very important because uh, there is a big, big change in the preamble. Uh, in the initial version of SIPA, we talked about the precautionary uh, principle and uh, a lot of, um, of weight is given to that. If I can find uh, my little note on that. Um, it used to say that um, that uh, we have to um, to put emphasis on on precautionary uh, approach, but at the uh, in the final version of S five, it goes more into managing the um, the toxic substances and not on prevention. Um, so. Next was that 50 amendments were defeated or withdrawn. And uh, out of which one, I think it's very important that we mention some so that we push uh, to have them in the other uh, approved at the other place. So for example, um, defining in a better way the timelines for assessment, um, the final decisions and the publication of the regulations uh, these are very important amendments that unfortunately were defeated, but we uh, we need to have to, we need to try it for a second time at the other place. Um, more prescriptive opportunities for public consultation. Also, those there were two amendments regarding that that were unfortunately defeated. Um, this issue with the granting request for confidentiality, in our view, were very easy to obtain. And sometimes, uh, you know, it's not justified that we put first uh, the um, confidentiality issues such as um, uh, intellectual property or patent, uh, and we diminish the importance of the safety uh, of public. Uh, public safety. So this is very important. And for me, one thing that it is extremely important is that uh, in the initial version of uh, SIPA, the Schedule 1 holds the title list of toxic substances because the, the substances that are in this list are all toxic, including when the um, when the word plastic is mentioned in that list, um, seventy percent of compounds that are uh, in plastic uh, are toxic, and um, and the reason that we were given that they just took out the title list of toxic substances from this uh, schedule one is because they didn't want it to interfere with recycling potential. 
But um, with respect to plastic, what we all know is that plastic end up in as microplastic, and today it can be found in uh, in our bodies. So um, at the end, it's still toxic, and inside our bodies, they will still go into degradation, and they will disintegrate into the uh, initial compounds, which are most of them, as I said, almost seventy percent uh, toxic. So. Um, what is the process? So as I mentioned in the Senate, we started in February 22 and we passed to a first reading, second reading. These five months, the committee study, we put a report and we adopted the amendments and we pass into the third reading and we uh, send it to the other, to the other place. Um, the uh, at the other place uh, is now over there in the House of Commons. It will go into a second reading. It will go into committee. It will go to a report stage, and finally, uh, it will uh, uh, be given royal assent. Maybe sometime in uh, in uh, hopefully early December. Okay, so I think I want to stop there. And uh, if you have any questions, I will be happy to to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandra Galvez. We appreciate that presentation. Um, that was concise and compelling. Thank you. Um, so we're going to save questions until after the three presentations, although anyone is welcome to put their questions in the chat box at any time. So at this point, um, if we could get uh, Joe's slides up, Zoe, and I will go ahead and introduce Joe. So Joseph Castrilli joined the Canadian Environmental Law Association in 2008 as legal counsel and is a member of the Ontario and British Columbia bars practicing in the areas of environmental and natural resources law. He has also taught environmental law courses and seminars at Queen's University, the University of Toronto and Osgoode Hall Law School at York University. And Joe, whenever you're ready, you can take it away. Um, <clears throat> thank you, April. Uh, and thank you to uh, Senator Galvez for her uh, presentation. As um, Senator Galvez mentioned, uh, CEPA is Canada's primary federal law for addressing environmental and human health impacts of uh, industrial uh, chemicals. It's not limited to industrial chemicals, but a very big part of the statute is about industrial chemicals. So the first question to ask is, how are we doing? Um, we see um, slide four. Um, this first slide deals with the si uh, situation nationally. And it covers a 15 year period, uh, 2006 to 2020, which basically uh, is coextensive with the chemicals management plan period um, and program uh, under SEPA. And what uh, this slide basically tells us is that um, while federal requirements reduced by millions of kilograms uh, on site air releases of 32 known or suspected cancer causing agents. On-site disposal and land releases of the same chemicals increased by tens of millions of kilograms over the same period. Uh, next slide. Uh, taking a look at this situation at the provincial level, we're looking at a couple of um, uh, provinces here who are uh, have fairly large uh, provincial economies. Um, again, the same uh, time period, 15-year uh, period of 2006 to 2020 for the same 32 cancer-causing agents. In Quebec, on-site air releases uh, decreased by 55% over this period, but on-site disposal and land releases increased by 234%. In British Columbia, a similar picture, on-site air releases um, decreased by 48%. Uh, percent, but on-site disposal and land releases increased by 186 uh, percent. Next slide um, looks at one chemical, um, a chemical that um, uh, has been known to be toxic since the Roman period. Uh, and again, we're looking at the same 15-year uh, sequence of uh, 2006 to 2020. Nationally, air um, uh, or uh, on-site air releases of arsenic uh, decreased by 67%, excuse me, but increased by over 400% uh, with respect to on-site disposal and land release. Uh, and then in Quebec, um, where this is almost an extreme example, um, on-site air releases of arsenic decreased by 8%, 
but increased by almost 2000% um, with respect to on-site disposal and land releases over the same period. Next slide. What do we take from the data? I take two things from the data. Uh, firstly, that moving carcinogens from one environmental pathway, uh, such as air, to another environmental pathway, such as land, does not represent progress in protecting human health and the environment. And secondly, it essentially represents putting a different group of people at risk and a different part of the environment at risk. So um, what I um, want to focus on, there are lots of things to focus on in Bill S5 and also in SEPA, but in the, the allotted time, I wanted to just focus on the issue of pollution prevention planning. It's an issue that Senator Galvez mentioned in her remarks and um, uh, I think is an appropriate one to focus on for the purposes of, uh, of this webinar. Um, and I think the issue of pollution prevention planning is one of the characteristics of SEPA um, that contributes to the problem as it is current, as the legislation is currently drafted and also as it's implemented. Uh, firstly, this particular slide notes that uh, pollution prevention planning is still discretionary under the statute, and that's true, notwithstanding the amendments uh, in the Senate uh, last month, or uh, I guess in June. Um, so the minister is still not required to compel persons to create pollution prevention plans for every substance that's in Schedule 1. There are 150 substances in Schedule 1. And since uh, 2000, only 25 out of 150 substances have been made subject to a pollution prevention plan. And if you do the math, um, at the rate of, of roughly 25 substances every 20 years, uh, which is the period since 1999 to now, it will take Canada into the 22nd century to impose pollution prevention planning on just the existing Schedule One chemicals, let alone all those substances that are likely to be added to Schedule One over the next 80 years. Next slide. Another facet of pollution prevention as it's being practiced uh, under SEPA, part four, is that um, Pollution uh, prevention is um, not pollution abatement and pollution abatement is not pr uh, pollution prevention. Pollution prevention is about stemming the creation and use of toxic substances. That's endemic to the definition of uh, pollution prevention in the statute. Pollution abatement is about controlling releases and em emissions and discharges. And what has happened over the last 20 plus years under part four of SEPA is that Canada has allowed industry to use the uh, pollution abatement as a substitute for pollution prevention planning. A majority of the time, a pollution prevention plan has been prepared under SEPA. Go to the um, next slide, 16. Um, a third aspect of uh, pollution prevention planning that is deficient in part four of SEPA is the issue of uh, safer alternatives. It is simply not a central focus of Bill S-5, and it is not a central focus of SEPA as currently drafted. Um, the issue of alternatives has very few references in Bill S-5. And um, just two examples from, really taken from Schedule 1. There are only uh, 19 substances in the proposed Schedule 1 of uh, Bill S-5, which would basically divide um, uh, schedule one into two parts. The first uh, um, 19 substances are the only ones that would be eligible for substitution under uh, Bill S-5 uh, and also eligible for prohibition um, uh, under Bill S-5. That's out of 150. 87% uh, of the toxic substances in Schedule 1, that's all the substances that are proposed for Part 2, um, are not subject to any kind of alternatives analysis and not subject to prohibition for that matter. And it uh, has also been the case that um, pollution prevention uh, as a regime has been applied by the government um, uh, because it's only been applied as pollution abatement. It um, is not going to have an effect whatsoever in terms of prohibiting any of the roughly 132 substances in Schedule 2, uh, excuse me, uh, Part 2 of Schedule 1. Uh, one other uh, issue I wanted um, to talk about just briefly is one that uh, Senator Galvez mentioned in her comments as well, 
um, uh, she uh, correctly noted that uh, Bill S-5 um, uh, refers or recognizes a right to a healthy environment, but it also uh, recognizes it even as amended by the Senate with a number of caveats. Uh, those include um, having to be subject to reasonable limits and also, again, based on economic and other factors. But even leaving um, uh, that aside, um, the existing citizen suit remedy in SEPA, which would go hand in hand with a right to a healthy environment, has not been used in over 20 years precisely because there are a variety of procedural barriers to its use under, under SEPA. The government does not propose removing these barriers, so in, in my respectful submission, the right to a healthy environment may not be enforceable. I, I also note that this was a concern that was identified by uh, Senator Galvez committee in its observations report on Bill S-5. Uh, next slide. Um, a similar argument can be made in connection with the issue of uh, lack of mandatory testing. Uh, Bill S-5 does authorize collection of data on a number of issues, such as endocrine disruption. It also authorizes the minister to consider available information on vulnerable populations and cumulative effects of a potential toxic substance. But in none of these cases does the bill direct the minister to require testing by industry uh, when there are information gaps on whether the substance is toxic. This is also an issue that was identified by the Senate. So um, in a nutshell, what should be done? Um, I have four short re uh, recommendations, which are expanded upon in draft amendments to Bill S-5 that we've provided to both the Senate and the House. Firstly, make pollution prevention planning mandatory for all Schedule I substances. Strictly limit the use of pollution abatement measures as substitutes for pollution prevention. Thirdly, make substitution a central feature of SEPA. And uh, fourthly, clarify the right to a healthy environment and make it enforceable by removing the existing barriers um, to its use under the statute. Uh, should also make testing mandatory where available information is not adequate to determine if the substance is toxic or capable of becoming toxic. Um, there are a number of other issues I identify in the, in the um, uh, slide deck presentation, which I'm not going to focus on for the, uh, in the interest of time. And if we can go to slide 23. Um, in summary, uh, Bill S-5 focuses, in my view, on housekeeping measures instead of robust, uh, robust changes. It proposes to fix what is not broken in SEPA, and it does not correct what is not working in the act. And in some instances, um, uh, things of, that we know have not worked as, uh, are, are things that we know have not worked for over 20 years. And in my view, um, Canadian public should not have to wait another 20 years to fix SEPA in 2040 um, uh, in addressing uh, problems that we know are long overdue for reform today. Uh, thank you, April, and, and thanks, thanks to the audience, and I'd be happy to answer any questions later. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, thank you for that presentation, and uh, I knew you had been with SELA a long time. I didn't know you'd been around since Roman times. <laughs> on arsenic there. Um, all right, so while I'm introducing our next speaker, um, Zoe, if you wanna put Hugh's slides up. So our next speaker is Hugh Benavides, who has been advising Nature Canada on how to improve part six of SEPA for two years now. Among his other experience, he was the legislative assistant to the chair of the House of Commons Environment Committee, Committee when SEPA 1999 became law. And along with Faye de Leon, represented the Canadian Environmental Law Association during the SEPA review around 2005 to 2007. And Hugh, over to you. All right, thanks, April, and thanks to Senator Galvez and uh, to Joe for setting me up for this uh, next portion. Um, I'm just going to stay with this slide for a little bit because um, I want to talk about part six of SEPA and, and uh, situate it a little bit. Um, Nature Canada, Mark Butler, who's here, and I in particular have been working for a couple of years and Mark for quite a bit longer on uh, and had concerns about part six of SEPA, which is meant to uh, regulate and control and prevent pollution by uh, 
what the act calls living organisms or products of biotechnology. And that's distinct from the other parts of SEPA uh, that the others have mentioned, particularly part five, which deals with um, uh, what Joe referred to as industrial chemicals. Um, uh, but I, I, I want to just talk about the challenges and opportunities uh, posed by the fact that we have uh, part six as a separate part. Um, in many ways, part six of SEPA is sort of the poor cousin of part five. Uh, for one thing, uh, many fewer substances compare, for example, what Joe has described about industrial chemicals. Many fewer substances have been allowed into commerce under part six than under part five. Uh, for another example, and these are the challenges I want to talk about, um, only minor adjustments to part six were proposed by uh, the government initially in Bill S-5, and only a very few amendments were made uh, by the Senate during its review to um, part six uh, in the process that Senator Galvez has described. Um, so the opportunities presented by part six and, and, and by having the bill now in the House of Commons is that we can work upstream, if I can use that expression, from what we've done with uh, so-called industrial chemicals to take literally uh, what the act says in its short and long titles and in its preamble and some of the wonderfully strong language that appears early in the act to prevent pollution and to use precautionary approaches rather than reacting to problems and trying to manage substances when uh, they have already entered uh, commerce and entered our environment. Um, so that's really uh, the key. So with that, uh, Zoe, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so just to then pick up on what uh, Professor Diamond said in the first, uh, some of what she said in the, in the first, in the earlier webinar a couple of weeks ago, um, she said, Professor Diamond talked about the planetary boundary research and novel entities. And this is just uh, to situate the idea that both here uh, in this sh very short excerpt and in SEPA, we have the larger uh, universe of, of substances and we have uh, within that uh, chemicals and then we have organisms. And so I've uh, highlighted some of the language here. Um, novel entities include organisms not previously known to the Earth system. So that therefore embraces uh, the kind of organisms we're trying to deal with in part six um, of SEPA. Um, and so I'll go relatively quickly through the remaining slides and just focus on a couple of places. Um, and sort of summarize what uh, we've talked about in, in previous uh, webinars and try not to leave behind those who missed those earlier uh, webinars because Nature Canada's recommendations have remained uh, pretty consistent and we've made some good progress thanks to Senator Galvez and her colleagues in the Senate and we need to build on those. So throughout the process before Bill S-5, uh, Nature Canada has been recommending that um, there be consistent and clear public notice uh, of when proponents want to manufacture or import new living organisms. Uh, we, we've recommended that there be meaningful public involvement in the assessments that take place of those um, organisms, including, or in addition to that, uh, consultation to obtain the free prior and informed consent of Indigenous peoples. Um, and I would just add that um, in uh, the Senate, the, the Senators made an important amendment to one of the recitals in the preamble that adds to reference to the Government of Canada's commitment to implementing the United Nations Declaration uh, that implementation should include explicitly, and the Senate added these words, uh, free prior and informed consent. But there's much more work to be done than reference to that in the preamble. We need to make that uh, have life. And we 
largely leave that to our Indigenous colleagues to recommend how to do that. But this has been an important part of our recommendations for uh, part six all along. Um, and finally, something that we've developed is a way, and this is a way to um, involve the public and improve that consultation for there to be a simple determination and a straightforward and clear and objective, clear to everyone determination of whether we need a new organism uh, in our environment and in Canada. So next slide, thanks. Um, so we've said that the minister should be required to give public notice that there will be an assessment and, and provide meaningful uh, involvement through the opportunity to test the evidence put forward, uh, allow the public to have access to any waivers of requirements by the proponent to provide certain information, and that the public have the opportunity to test that information and present additional information. Next, please. And we've asked and recommended that the proponent have the burden of showing not only that its organism is not toxic or capable of becoming toxic, as that, as, as, a, as that word is defined in SEPA, and that the proponent have to be required to show what we've called a demonstrable need for that living organism, or what SEPA calls a significant new activity involving it. Next, please. We want to, the Minister to be, of the Environment and Climate Change to be required to announce each step of the process in a timely and very clear public manner and to make, regu uh, to make regulations prescribing how those public processes should work. Um, next. As I said, uh, the government overall should uh, uh, align SEPA with Indigenous rights and uh, have an emphasis on public rights to environmental decision-making. And as Senator Galvez uh, briefly suggested or made reference to, I don't wanna put words in her mouth, um, that public rights to information should trump claims of business confidentiality. And that's another notion that's intertwined with, with need that we've really pushed. Next, please. So in this round in the House of Commons, we are, are trying to provide that clarity that uh, would show what, what do we mean by a, a new living organism is needed. And so we want that determination to be able to be made quickly and clearly uh, with, and, and including to avoid that kind of uncertainty that Senator Galvez referred to that leads to litigation. So if uh, a, a new living organism would, when exposed to its wild counterpart, uh, would pose no hazard to that wild counterpart or to biological diversity, and the organism would benefit biological diversity and bring other social and environmental public benefits, then uh, our suggestion is that that is demonstrable need. And then we have an amendment to show a roadmap where if that demonstrable need is not clearly shown, then the, minister, the process stops and the minister uh, is required to prohibit its manufacture or its import into Canada. If demonstrable need is shown, uh, then the process as outlined in SEPA would continue. But it's then and only then that we get into a new living organism, perhaps uh, under certain conditions, almost certainly, uh, entering into the environment, as we as as is the case with Part Five su substances, and uh, Senator Galvez um, scooped me with uh, talking about process. So I'll just I have this one slide, uh, and of course we are at the second reading uh, stage. There's been part of one day of second reading debate. Once that debate is completed, and we don't know how long that will take, the bill will um, move to committee, uh, which we hope will be. Uh, uh, robust and lots of good consideration given there. Um, and we can, I'm sure uh, we can answer any questions about the process. Next, please. And I just put uh, up the standard uh, map of the committee room to show that if uh, people are, are where you'll sit, if you, if you are asked to make uh, submissions and appear before the, uh, 
uh, the Environment Committee. Um, next, please. And I'm sure that uh, uh, we can answer questions about um, both what Nature Canada and CELA are recommending and uh, ways to find out more. And I've just added uh, some suggestions here that if you would like to see changes, certain changes to SEPA that you call or write your member of parliament, and then the link to follow the process of the um, Bill S-5, the, the progress of Bill S-5 through the committee, how you can do that, uh, who the members of the committee are, how to contact the, uh, the clerk of the committee and the chair and the other, mem and the other members. And um, that information's all there. Um, final slide, um, Zoe, or the next one, that's it, thanks. And then uh, there are some other slides with some background that I've used in other presentations that will be available when this is post, uh, posted. And uh, that's all I wanted to say. And thank you. Look forward to your questions and the discussion. Thank you very much, Hugh. Appreciate that. Okay, so this is going to move us into the Q&A portion of the webinar today. So Zoe, if I can get you to put the closing slides up. Um, because I believe there are a number of helpful links in there that folks might want to be having a look at while we're talking. That's great. Uh, and we will share some of the actual links for some of those resources in the chat box momentarily. So just a couple of reminders before we start taking questions, um, the recording of today's session, as well as the slide decks from the three presentations, will all be shared back with all of you by email, um, as well as they will be posted on the CELA website. And I'm going to share the link in just a moment of where you'll find that. There is also a website or a web page, sorry, on the CELA website that contains really all of the resources um, that Joe referenced. Um, so I'll pop that in the chat right there. Okay, and thanks for the um, very expedient presentations from our three panelists. We do have quite a chunk of time for um, Q&A now, which is great. Um, we've left ourselves some good time for discussion. So I've been monitoring the chat. Um, I've seen a few questions asked that have been answered in the chat already. I've seen a couple come up that might be a better fit for a couple of our other sessions. Um, you'll remember this is the second in our four-part series. Um, so while I have a look at the questions that are still um, kind of open to be answered, I will ask all of our panelists as well as staff from Seal and Nature Canada if they would like to turn their cameras on so that we can see all of you. And I will ask the panel first and any of our staff if they have any top of mind questions and or sort of last comments that they wanted to share before we take questions from the chat. So did any of the panelists or any of the staff have a question that we should be starting with while we wait for folks to pop a few more questions into the chat box? And while you think about that, to everyone listening, if you uh, would like to share your questions in the chat box at any time. All right, I'm not seeing any burning questions from our speakers. So one of the questions um, that was in the chat and I will try to summarize it. Um, reference is an important motion that was defeated was adding, and I'm going to use the abbreviation here, RF hyphen EMR to SEPA amendments and the merits of the motion was not debated. Um, so the view is that radio frequency electromagnetic radiation investigation belongs in SEPA and there was a link shared. It was a briefing note by Prevent Cancer Now and Canadians for Safe Technology. And the question goes on to just essentially ask, what can we do now, given that that motion was uh, not debated and was defeated? So would anyone like to weigh in on that topic of uh, electromagnetic radiation and its inclusion or not in SEPA? I can, I can just say the, the answer, I can repeat the answer from the government when this point was raised. And the government said that they were conducting uh, consultation. And this answer was also given with respect to um, engineer um, modified organisms. It was the same answer given when we talk about uh, radioactivity, uh, radioactive. Um, and <laughs> I remember there was something funny when they say that uh, the bill was only regulating substances. And so they say that radioactivity was not a substance. 
And so that, that was really funny because, you know, radioactive elements are there in the table of elements. So, <laughs> you know, it's like nickel, it's like a lead, it's like arsenic, it's like any other thing, it's there too. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's, the, that's what they said. Okay. All right, thank you, Senator Galvez. Did anyone else want to weigh in? Hugh, I see you unmuting. Yeah, and I, pardon me, I might have to defer to more the more scientifically inclined here, but I, and I don't have it in front of me, but the, the definition of substance in the, in SEPA now is extremely broad. Uh, and as I said, it includes genetically engineered organisms, which we wouldn't think of in plain language as including substance, but uh, I found it compelling in the Senate committee, those who argued, uh, I suspect correctly, that as Senator Galvez says, uh, that definition is also broad enough to include uh, radio frequencies. So um, even if even if uh, radio frequency is not a substance, uh, certainly the the act one could envision the act being expanded to have a whole part uh, dealing with radio frequency. Um, it's already an omnibus act. It deals with a broad range of things, including auto emissions, uh, uh, dumping of waste at sea as well as parts four, five, and six that we've talked about today. Okay, thank you, Hugh. Just pausing for a moment to see if anyone else wanted to answer. Okay. Um, a short question that came into the chat to me, um, is PFAS on the toxics list? That might be something for Faye, but I, I think uh, I think it is, um, and that's why the government had the PFAS. Well, anyway, I should stop before I get. Uh, um, I'll, I'll just I'll just offer uh, two comments, which is it it is, but not the full class of PFAS, right? Because there's over five thousand chemicals in that class. Um, there are probably three big subgroups of the PFAS class, but with mostly the long chain um, long chain. Um, PFAS that are included on Schedule 1 of SEPA. Uh, that's a really quick uh, response to that question. Okay, thanks, Faye. Joe, did you want to add anything? Uh, no, I was going to uh, give a, um, a slimmed down version of uh, Faye's answer, so um, yeah. she did a better job than I would have. Okay, thanks, Joe. Okay, I have a, a, a great big question, um, but I'm going to uh, answer this one, or uh, sorry, share this one first, because I think it's a bit more uh, focused. So a question that just came in was, can you talk a bit about how these changes to LO regulation compare a line connect to with current talks at the CFIA around GE regulation, or how these inform the broader landscape of GM regulation we're facing? And I'm hoping all of those abbreviations make lots of sense to folks like you. Anyone want to take a shot at that one? Meanwhile, if Mark has already absorbed that, I'm just reading it now. Yeah, um, take a moment, that's fine. Feel free to jump in, Mark. <laughs> um, I have not, although I've been getting some of the correspondence, I have not kept up with uh, current talks at the Canadian Food Inspection Agency about uh, the regulation of genetically engineered organisms. Um, That's Mark? okay. Yeah, I, I, it's uh, hi, it's um, Mark Butler with uh, Nature Canada. Uh, Caitlin, uh, good question. I know you and Lucy have been working really hard on this, uh, pushing back <clears throat> on, I think, uh, government efforts inspired, uh, not inspired, perhaps it's the right word, but uh, pushed by industry to deregulate uh, the whole regulation of genetically engineered uh, organisms, saying that as long as it's not transgenic, then it's just like plant breeding, which doesn't uh, bear scientific scrutiny. And I, you know, this this hasn't got a lot of attention until recently when the organic industry kind of woke up to the threat uh, and pushed back. And then we saw the, 
I believe the Minister of Health or Agriculture uh, saying, um, whoa, uh, CFIA, uh, what's going on here? Uh, we need to look at this. Uh, so, I mean, you know, we're, our focus has been on uh, what does this technology mean for nature? And uh, we want to get ahead of it. Uh, before uh, genetic pollution is widespread, just like uh, chemical pollution is uh, widespread. Um, uh, so we're trying to push back and create a better regulatory structure uh, before the problem is so big and pervasive that we can no longer control it, which is really what we have when it comes to chemicals. And we really don't have a good grasp of what those chemicals are doing to the environment, doing to us and how they're interacting. And we don't want to see a repeat uh, with, um, with genetic pollution. And just to note that uh, Environment Canada looks set to approve another batch of genetically engineered aquarium fish, uh, which recently escaped and were found breeding in the wild in Brazil. And uh, also uh, uh, the same company has just submitted another proposal uh, for more engineered uh, aquarium fish. Uh, Hugh, do you want to uh, tie, that with, tie that up with a bow? Well, yeah, I had just thanks because that gave me a bit of time to think. Um, thanks for those comments, Mark. I, I think we should be agnostic uh, to a certain point about where things and by whom they're regulated, but also not naive. Um, we should use the capacity and the powers that we have in legislation and in departments with various types of expertise. Uh, we constantly need to be vigilant in promoting the strengthening of that capacity, especially as new industries um, develop and build that capacity and strengthen it in places where regulatory capture is less likely to take place and to a lesser degree. So um, SEPA has always been uh, both that place with omnibus powers, as I said, or omnibus areas that it's supposed to regulate, but it's also always been a residual act where if uh, equivalent uh, standards are deemed to be to exist elsewhere then that regulation, for example, feeds and seeds, goes off to Agriculture Canada or other departments. That may, while we can be agnostic up to a certain point, maybe those aren't the best places to regulate. Um, so really it's, a, it's our job as citizens to make sure that uh, the strongest capacity and the strongest regulation is there. And let's just say uh, a lot of our supervision is needed to achieve that. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So I'm tracking the chat at the same time. Okay, so a question that was posed a little while ago that I would like to read, um, and I might reframe it, um, but I'll read the original, which was, so really how hopeless is this process? The review seems so disappointing, any positive outcomes? Um, and perhaps I'll reframe that as an opportunity for um, anyone who would like to, to weigh in about, you know, what outcomes are we hoping for and should we be pushing for? And I know that each of you spoke to that in your presentations, but perhaps briefly, um, you know, given some of the negatives that we've heard, what are the things we should be pushing for? What are we hoping for out of this process? So would you, should the speakers like to take a moment and respond to that? Joe, I see you're unmuted. Do you wanna jump in there? Yes. Um, none of us has any control over what either the Senate or the House of Commons will do uh, with respect to amending uh, a bill um, at the end of the day. But uh, I, I think, uh, the place to start is uh, all the members of the committees, both in the Senate and the House, have to hear from members of the public on what members of the public think uh, is right or wrong with, in this case, SEPA. Uh, I, I think that process occurred in the Senate, and I'm hopeful that it'll, it'll occur in the House of Commons as well. Um, the process of reform of some of these statutes sometimes takes years. Um, or even tens of years, um, and it's not ideal, but it's what we have. And I think the place to start is um, the committee structure for both the Senate and the House has to be prepared to hear 
uh, views that they might not that, that the government might not agree with. And that did happen in the Senate, and I'm hopeful that it will happen in, in the House. I would like to add that um, you have to remember that this bill is a, a highly technical bill. Not everybody understands what the methodology, the process, the, the issues that we are discussing, uh, understand everything about them. Um, just for example, take the risk assessment and the ecotoxicology and the, as, as I mentioned, in the bill, highest risk is use. It says that substances, when they are going to be deemed of highest risk, they are going to go this path. But the definition of highest risk is not there. So the other question is, who's going to take this decision of putting the threshold of highest risk? Is highest risk means like uh, does in the US EPA, an additional risk of one death per million people? Um, that it has a, a, a threshold, well, we don't know. It's not, it's not there. And nobody seems to understand that we need to put a threshold. Otherwise, uh, who, uh, how are we going to manage these high risk substances? Um, the other thing is um, with respect to the cumulative effects. So we, it's true, we have had now cumulative effects, but how this is going to be um, studied in the methodology, we don't know. So I can tell you from my experience about cumulative effects, uh, because I was implicated in a study of um, migratory birds that, that came from Quebec to Mexico City, and, um, and they die, 10,000 uh, ducks die. And so we asked for answers. And the answers was, uh, they landed in a, in a an effluent, and in an industrial effluent, and they die. And uh, the results came saying, individually, every single contaminant, there were like 300 contaminants present, individually, none of them exceed the threshold of toxicity. And, uh, and therefore, you know, um, the pollution in those waters didn't have nothing to do with the death of the 10,000 DAX. So if we don't understand how we're going to measure cumulative effects, like, for example, we have also these people living in Rayom Noranda, where there is a, a, a foundry that um, puts out smokes. And the government is saying, well, we are going to accept the three times the present limit of, of nickel or, or lead or arsenic in the atmosphere. But there is several contaminants that are there. And that the rate of cancer in, in women and children is higher in this region. But if we don't say what is the threshold, how we're going to, we just keep living in the same situation. So uh, it is important that uh, if the um, representatives don't understand the technicalities behind, at least that they understand the effects, the impact on society and why it's so important that we better prevent rather than deal with the contaminants that are already in this, uh, in this area falling down and impacting populations. And somebody has to make the link between how much it costs, the health, um, to, to, uh, to um, the, the health uh, uh, cost to uh, having to deal with a population that has higher rates of cancer. Uh, these these comparisons are very horrible to do, but I think that's that's the language that politicians um, understand, and that's why they put the limitation of the economic factor in the right to a healthy environment. You know, otherwise, why they will they put it? Very well said. Thank you, Senator Galvez. Thank you for that. Did anyone else want to add anything on that question? Okay, I think that summed it all up. So thank you. Uh, okay, so I'm seeing a number of links being shared in the chat. Um, don't think we have a lot of open questions left. Some comments and some back and forth on some of the questions that have gone back and forth. Mark, are you seeing one or do you have a question? Well, I always have questions, but um, yeah, you know, I was thinking, and this is perhaps uh, 
uh, for Senator Galvez, but you know, um, on some of our amendments around genetically engineered uh, animals, I know you don't have parties in the Senate, but you have groups, but we saw some sort of uh, cooperation amongst senators from different groups uh, like Senator Patterson with the Canadian senators uh, supported some of our amendments as did you who are in the independent uh, senators group and we also got support from indigenous senators so it was kind of a uh, cross party if you like or cross group support for some of our amendments and I'm just wondering you know how do you generate that uh, bipartisan support for some of these amendments which whether it's protecting nature respecting indigenous rights or protecting the health of canadians um how do is there any do you have any advice on how to do that or yes sure but don't quote me on that <laughs> you have to talk to them individually you cannot put them in in the same group and and talk to them as a group it's impossible because I, I don't understand really why it is like that with politicians, but they see each other in competition. And, and it's sad for, with respect with the environment, because at the point climate, environment, pollution has been politicized and it should have never been politicized. It should be completely outside the politics because it's for the public good. It's for the public health. So it has nothing to do with with um, you know at an ideology, and uh, but this is the our reality, and uh, this is even even more clear for me with respect to climate. You know, um, we 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 cannot put them all in the same place, and so you have to talk to them individually, and and I and you know when you talk to them individually, they are so logical and so. Uh, uh, understanding and 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 they are and and they are ready to help you because um, they they know that you are being a logical reasonable person. We are not asking for the moon. We are not asking for uh, things that are going. To, actually, always what I ask is more for efficient efficiency. You know, just efficiency, um, cl clarity. Uh, because there is a lot of cost that goes around in when something is not clear. Take the litigation cost, take the, the analysis cost, take the, the, the cleanup cost in managing the, uh, the, the contaminants. Um, Senator McCallum in, uh, in, um, in one of the clauses, um, when there was a space for other type of concern, she had the tailing ponds um, and the fracking um, industry and that was I, I find that that was excellent that was great that she added uh, these issues and uh, and so yeah because you know it, it is logical and because um, the conversations were um, were taken were done previously and so everybody realizes that this was not the case for the uh, eutrophication and the cyanobacteria which is a different process in which there is not the involvement of a toxic substance that comes from, you know, to excess of nutrients, excess of phosphorus, excess of nitrogen, but they are not considered as toxic. So uh, that was a different thing. Uh, and also, um, you have to be creative. Um, you have to come with, um, you know, um, other ways to a little bypass the, the 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 framework as as it is the rigidity the rigidity of 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 the bills and i think i think that that was for us excellent the job that uh, the law clerk did with us because we tell the law clerk what we want but there are so many places in the bill where this can make a better sense and uh, and so this help a lot Okay, thank you. Uh, and I'll just draw folks attention in case you're not tracking the chat really closely. There was a question about whether the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment or Kate made a submission, which Mark shared. And I think to Senator Galvez's point about creative approaches um, to making change in these areas, you know, partnering with 
um, folks in the health sector is definitely an important one. Uh, so we are at 10 after two, we have just five minutes left. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to ask Faye to speak to the next two webinars in the series, um, do a little teasers for those. But before I pass it over to Faye, does anyone have a last thought that they want to leave us with um, on this topic around SEPA before we move to the next webinars and some next steps and thank yous? Well, maybe I can just offer something that occurs to me now and then that, you know, we can look at government processes and the House and the Senate as something other, but ultimately these belong to us, uh, our parliament, uh, our, these processes belong to us. It's our government and we need to keep practicing our voices uh, to demand what we want for our environment, uh, for our country. Um, so I would encourage us to do that and, and uh, contact the people that we elect to, to, to oversee our government uh, to get what we know we need to prevent pollution and protect our health. Thanks. Well said, Hugh, thank you. All right, Faye, did you want to talk to us a bit about the next two sessions in the series? Sure, I think that's a good segue, um, Hugh. Thank you for that. Uh, and thank you to Senator Galvez for joining us for this call. I think one of the reasons, uh, so we this webinar series was designed specifically to try to engage um, groups um, to participate in this process. It is very complex, uh, but we thought, you know, having a four part series would be good some more specific than others in terms of topics. Uh, so this is the second of four. Um, we have another one upcoming on October 19th, which is next week. And we will be joined by an Indigenous panel, um, really great uh, group of people who will talk about their experience um, on the SEPA review, as well as uh, identifying ways to uh, talk about SEPA in the context of Indigenous rights. Uh, so we'll be joined by Senator McCullum, um, and we will be joined by three um, folks who represent Indigenous organizations. Um, Mike Perry from the National Métis Council, Joshua McNeely from the First Aboriginals um, People's um, Group. I'm not doing his group of justice. Congress um, of Aboriginal Peoples. There you go. And Sylvia Plains from the Amjanam community. Um, and so then we'll have the final webinar. Um, which will be focused on electromagnetic radiation. So several com um, questions around that. And um, Mark Butler will also join us and talk more specifically around the genetically uh, living, um, uh, genetically living organisms um, for the final one, which is set, scheduled for uh, October 26th. So we hope you can join us for that. And I think probably part of it is you'll see an ongoing theme in terms of how do you engage and um, what sh you should be doing. So um, we've heard from Senator Galvez, we've heard from Hugh indicating how important it is to, to engage in these process. So I would also encourage that that be part of the theme and the approach that we take with these webinars. Thanks. Thank you very much, Faye. So I'll just remind everyone that we will be sharing the recording in the slide decks uh, and also all of the many links that were shared in the chat. Um, in case you didn't have a chance to click all of those and save all of those, we will share those back um, in a little one pager perhaps uh, via email in the next couple of days. So we encourage you to sign up for those next two webinars. We'll share all these resources back with you. And I want to say a heartfelt thank you to Senator Galvez, to Hugh Benavides, to Joe Castrilli, and also to Faye and to Mark for being on the call today. Thank you to Zoe for keeping all the tech running smoothly in the background. And thank you to everyone who took time out of your day to join us and discuss this important topic. We look forward to connecting with you again on the next session. Have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye.